But here we have right now a duopoly and we're trapped in the duopoly. And one of the manifestations of that is that there are certain things that go unsaid. And so a big part of your career has been, that I've been aware of at least, I'm sure there are many aspects of it, but is, uh, is asking the tough questions of people who don't want those tough questions asked. And uh, you've been a hero of mine for sitting in those State Department utter BS sessions and asking the questions no one else wants to ask. And uh, before we go any further, my main question to you is, why do they keep letting you in? I, you know, it's, uh, well, are well, they masochistic or what? Well, you know, I haven't thrown anything, I guess. Yeah. They got to let me in. Um, they, But they have been adamant about not calling on me. Um, mm -hmm. So um, uh, my confession is that I actually haven't been going in very much lately because mm -hmm. they you know, I will have my hand up, uh, you know, the whole time, you know, you know, not the whole time, but every time there's a question, you know, uh, you know, right. they, they might call on somebody, I put my hand up. Anytime that a questioner asks something that's related to what I want to ask on, I say follow up. They usually respect that. They don't respect that with me. They literally go, you know, journalists, journalists, skip over Sam, journalists. Right, journalists. right. Okay. So it's a total blackballing. Um, and I'm not the only one. I mean, they, they've avoided other people like Liam Cosgrove, um, and Max Blumenthal came to a couple of, sure, sure. Uh, okay. of, of, of sessions. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, funny story, right after October 7th, uh, Max shows up for the first time and he sits next to me and I'm like, I don't know if you should sit next to me. I don't think that's a good strategic idea. And then, and then I realized Miller yeah. doesn't doesn't know what Max looks like. Oh, okay. Like, right. No, sit next to me. He's sure to call on you to try to taunt me. And sure enough, he did. He called on Max right after. That's really him. funny, particularly <laughs> because Max is also a guest on this week's show and sure. has been on the show before. So now, if Miller was a viewer of the Zero Hour, he would have known <laughs> what Max looks like. Um, uh, and talking about questions people don't want to answer, uh, something you wrote recently caught my eye. It was one of those, oh, yeah, moments. I'm like, yeah, that's right. And your your headline is new top secret docs. These are the ones that now the FBI is uh, furiously looking for the, the leaker. But new top secret docs acknowledge Israel's nuclear weapons arsenal, comma, and that, of course, being the biggest open secret for how many years now, 40 years in the Middle East, uh, comma, which violates the law and should trigger an aid cutoff, yet no Congress member asks. Tell us about that, if you would. Right. So um, Israel has a massive nuclear weapons arsenal. It was exposed by Mordecai Venunu, who Israel imprisoned for years and years. Um, there's laws on the books, um, the Arms Export Act and the uh, Glenn Symington Amendments um, that uh, cut off all U.S. aid to a country that's a nuclear proliferator. This was used against Pakistan by the Carter administration. Um, no administration has used this against Israel. They've entered into an agreement effectively with Israel not to acknowledge its nuclear weapons um, arsenal, um, and they've um, issued um, uh, policy statements, which themselves are confidential, saying that people in the government can't talk about Israel's nuclear weapons. And this seems to have extended even to members of Congress. So uh, I wrote a piece back in 2020. Uh, uh, well, the, the start of this is that Grant Smith, really interesting researcher, um, tried to challenge this in the courts to say there should be an aid cut off to Israel because of these laws. The courts threw it out purely on the basis that he didn't have standing, not on the merits. So he went to members of Congress and wrote all of the critics of Israel in a letter saying, you 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 have standing. You can do this. You can you know cut off aid to Israel using these legal mechanisms. None of them got back to him. Uh, when I learned about it, I wrote a piece 
uh, which in which I contacted every member of Congress from Rand Paul uh, to the squad and everybody in between who'd ever said a negative word about Israel. Um, and none of them would get back to me acknowledging that Israel has nuclear weapons. So this gag order on talking about is Israeli nuclear weapons seems to extend to members of Congress so that they are incapable or unwilling uh, to take on the task of talking about these weapons so that you could get an aid cut off. I mean, not just the armed, the, 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 some people are talking about cutting off weapons to Israel, but cutting off all aid, uh, which is, you know, Israel is the number one recipient. So this is a huge elephant in the room. And we still don't have a member of Congress with the courage to do this. So I would encourage people to be petitioning their members of Congress to do this. Or well, any and it raises an interesting question, which is <laughs> we've started to hear some discussion in Congress of the fact that, although it's very mild compared to the flagrant nature of the offense, uh, we started to hear some conversation about the fact that uh, it's a violation of the Leahy Act to provide arms for Israel, uh, given its human rights violations, which are pretty well documented, and that uh, uh, State Department staff documented that for Secretary of State Blinken, and he, he refused to act on it. So it's not as if all sanctions of any kind against Israel are necessarily off the table for Congress. But, well, and correct me if you think it's wrong, but it, my interpretation is wrong, but that specifically the nuclear, whether it's because it's all aid or whether it's because we're talking about nuclear weapons as a sensitive defense issue, uh, that somehow that's uh, a no-fly zone as far as members of Congress dealing with it are concerned, because of course they would have standing to go to court over this. We saw the same thing with Israel's uh, a violation of law, the lawsuit that was brought by the Center for Constitutional Rights that was dismissed on standing issues as well. Um, although the, ju uh, the judge, I believe, said they had, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they had good cause. Uh, they showed uh, uh, likely evidence that uh, U.S. law was being violated. They had no standing to, to bring the suit, but Congress presumably does have the standing. So what's why won't Congress a uh, challenge the uh, the gar the administration on uh, nuclear weapons, and b why won't they take any of these challenges to the courts? Um, I'm not sure if the Center for Constitutional Rights case, you know, didn't wasn't successful because of lack of standing of the plaintiffs, mm. or because the court said we can't run foreign policy. Uh, I see. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of that. Uh, so it's it's a different form of standing, right? Um, um, uh, there has been a lot of debate about the Leahy laws, and actually, when I questioned the State Department earlier this year uh, about Israel's nuclear weapons, it was in, you know, you know, jumping onto the conversation about the Leahy laws because if you ask the State Department, they'll say we we're, we're 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 looking into it, you know. We're 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 you know we're making a determination of, about the Leahy laws, like we do for any country. La 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 la. So I wanted to expose that fabrication, and you know said, well, you know, there's also these other provisions about nuclear weapons, uh, and you get around that by just not acknowledging the existence of Israel's nuclear weapons. The same way that I mean, <clears throat> U.S. government not acknowledging Israel's nuclear weapons was a foreshadowing of them. Not, not acknowledging genocide, not acknowledging massive uh, catastrophic human rights um, uh, uh, violations by Israel. Um, so it's it just the poignancy of the, you know, it's just how massively brazen um, their fabrications are that they're willing to say what nukes. Um, right. So I, I think it is powerful in that respect, but I think all of these, you know, uh, uh, aspects, um, all of these laws, and there's a myriad of them uh, that the U.S. is now is in violation with, and some whistleblowers coming out about them um, can and should be should be pursued. I mean, we're seeing. I mean, now with the utter flattening of northern Gaza, uh, horrors by the day. Um, 
you know, it, it's it's simply unspeakable. Um, uh, so I think that every possible legal mechanism should be pursued. I would even go so far as to say, you know, Biden has done two things recently, which members of Congress have said are unconstitutional, bombing Yemen without authorization. Um, and no Congress people have spoken out against this, but he's put in 100 U.S. troops into Israel. Um, those are both unconstitutional actions. You can't do that. That violates the War Powers Act. Um, and at, that is impeachable. Um, now, it's not the great crime <laughs> of what's going on in Gaza, but it is technically under the law impeachable. So, you you know, I think a member of Congress, perhaps, you know, nobody wants to do this before the election, but I would think at least some members of Congress after the election uh, would would move on this. Um, uh, there, there are two outgoing members of Congress who were targeted by APAC. Right. Right. Corey Bush and uh, Bowman. Right. Uh, it would be a very nice parting shot from either of them to say, you know, I supported Joe Biden, da, 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 da. What he's doing here is unconstitutional. I believe in the law. It's my duty to impeach. You could do that. Could yeah. Do that. Yeah. And of course, <clears throat> it would be nice if Congress reasserted its obligation to determine when and how to go to war, which is not an executive function, theoretically. Um, but, uh, well, we'll be following all of this, but Sam, before I let you go, sure. uh, just one last personal question. <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the cloud of BS that he, that uh, you know these uh, emits from these podiums uh is it's maddening to watch on you know on youtube much less or cnn much less in person much less trying to ask the questions and either be deflected or eventually not able to ask at all um how do you keep your sanity because i find myself getting a little frustrated agitated with all this stuff Sure, absolutely. It's my, it's my, it's my art. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> it's my art. That's what helps keep me keep my sanity there. Sorry, I don't mean to trigger the thing, but um, yeah, that's that's a that's a huge chunk of it. And um, yeah, just having a sense of history, um, you know that you know somebody's got to say something first, and then hopefully something will snowball. But it's sure as hell isn't going to happen unless somebody makes a move. Well, that's for sure. And uh, if not now, when? If not us, who? Right. So, uh, so as all as uh, always, I appreciate your writing, and for the first time, I also appreciate you coming on the program again. My guest, Sam Husseini, his work can be found at husseini.substack.com. Uh, Sam, keep up the good work, and thanks again for joining us been a delight talking with you, Richard. Same here. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard RJS Cap. We depend on your support here at the Zero Hour, so please give whatever you can at any of the links you see on your screen. Thanks so much.